Hello and good morning. It is 11 o'clock on Saturday. Hi, I'm going to be sharing my top tips on gardening queries, your gardening queries in a second. But first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mark Lane. I'm a TV gardening presenter. I'm an award-winning garden designer and a published author. And my new book, Royal Gardens of the World, will be out this autumn. So what are we going to be looking at this week? Well, you've been sending in your queries and your questions. So I've had to sift through them, but we're going to be picking up on a question that popped up last week, which was honey fungus. Is there a cure for honey fungus? We're also going to be looking at perlite. Is it sustainable or isn't it? Also aerobic composting or hot bins. We're also going to be looking at how to grow French beans and runner beans. And if we've got time, we're also going to be talking about honeysuckle, whether you've planted it in the right place or not. And there are many, many, many more queries, and I'm sure more will pop up, but let's see how we get going. So first question is, is there a cure for honey fungus? As I said, this came up from last week. Well, honey fungus is a common name given to several different species of the fungus armillaria. I know it's a bit of a mouthful. It's a parasitic fungi that affects the roots, the trunks, and stems of the plants. You sort of get this sort of creamy white sheet of fungus that grows between the bark and the plant tissue beneath it. And the fungus smells really strong of mushrooms. In Britain, we've got five main species of Armillaria. The two most damaging are Armillaria melia, which mainly attacks broadleaf trees, and Armillaria ostoyae, and it's, it's O-S-T-O-Y-A-E for anyone who wants to look that up, and that attacks conifers. There's also a Gallica form, and although it's very common, it seems, anyway, to only really affect exotic trees and shrubs. Good morning, Donna. Um, and, it, and also young plants that are in a weakened state. The other two species are less common and rarely cause serious damage. The fungus is really absolutely fascinating because it also develops these fungal strands called rhizomorphs. And these are black and could easily be mistaken for tree roots, but they're actually hollow. And like roots, they can be thick and thin and they can consist of one or several branched strands. They will feed on the host plant, but they will also grow through the soil until they find another source of food and then they'll grow at a rate of up to one meter a year. Isn't it incredible? Honey fungus, it is an absolute sod really of a um, fungus. Usually the first symptom to be seen is above ground. The infected plant normally dies back, has leaves, which are smaller than usual, generally lacks vigor, and may show cracking and weeping. And that's mainly around the bark area. And of course, the plant might die rapidly. Other symptoms might include poor cropping compared to previous years, and also premature autumn color. Good morning, Phil. Now, some plants, especially conifers, will leak a resin from around the base of the plant, um, making the honey fungus identification much easier. Black bootlace sized strands may be found if you dig around the soil below the affected plant, and that's these rhizomorphs. And in some cases, these strands will grow up covering the dead wood. Um, the strands tend to travel uh, in straight lines. So if one plant in a hedge starts to die, it's quite likely that one by one, the plants next to it will also die off. Occasionally, crops of honey colored toadstools can grow at the base of an infected plant during the late summer or early autumn and unfortunately i know this isn't really the answer that you wanted mm -hmm. but there are no longer any chemical fungus treatments control has really got to be done through good garden hygiene dig out the infected plant and their root systems and destroy the infected material this is honey fungus. I'm talking about honey fungus here. To prevent honey fungus spreading to unaffected areas, uh, you can introduce a physical barrier. 
such as a 45 centimeter deep sort of vertical strip of butyl rubber or pond lining will do absolutely perfectly or heavy duty plastic really plastic sheeting buried into the soil and that will block the rhizomorphs it should protrude about sort of two to three centimetres above the soil as well. And regular deep cultivation will also break up those rhizomorphs and limit the speed of the spread of this fungus. Also, don't leave dead trees in the garden. Dig them up and remove them. Burn them, um, take them down to the tip, uh, just get rid of them really, really well away from the garden, really. There are, however, some plants which show a little bit more resistance to honey fungus, and they're things like yew, beech, choicea, box, clematis, hebes, and bamboo. Um, but these plants are notably susceptible to honey fungus and frequently are cured at any age. Avoid them when replanting infected land, and these can, these are. There's quite a list, I'm afraid. There's apple, the azaleas, birch, blackberry, buddleia, cedar, cherry, cotoneaster, elm, flowering currant, forsythia, gooseberry, hop, hydrangeas, Japanese cedars, Lawson cypress, lilacs, maples, pears, peonies, pines, plums, privets, raspberries, rhodes, roses, viburnums, walnuts, western hemlock, willow, and wisteria. Everyone's probably asking, why on earth do we garden um, if there is this horrible fungus, honey fungus, and it affects all of these plants? Well, I'm afraid that's just nature, um, and uh, we just get on with it as gardeners, uh, something that we do. Um, please remember that throughout um, this broadcast, if you like anything, then please leave your comments. Um, please uh, share with your friends. And also, please remember to send me your comments as well, because I can't really do this without you. The next question. Oh, before I do, good morning, Phil, and good morning, Penny, to you as well. Uh, so good morning. So we're now going on to perlite. And someone's asked the question that they've always used it, but is it sustainable? And of course, we really do want to be sustainable as gardeners. So what's the simplest solution? Is there, is there a simple answer? Well, perlite is really one of nature's most versatile and efficient minerals. Um, it's formed of molten magmatic rock, which is also known as volcanic glass. And it acts as a lightweight, non-organic soil conditioner for commercial growers, landscapers, and home gardeners. And you could probably see me adding it into my compost when I'm doing seedlings just to open up the soil a little bit better. And it provides numerous benefits. Um, I suppose the great thing about perlite is that there's no expiration date. Um, because it's inorganic, it remains stable and it doesn't compose or break down. And it won't even mold or attract pests, making it really virtually timeless, I suppose. So you could see that as a bad thing um, because it's always going to be around. Um, but from a gardener's point of view, it's good because you can put it in the shed, forget about it, and then you can go back and use it again, maybe in a year's time. The second thing is that it's lightweight and it's easy to store and use. It's a lightweight soil media, as I say, and the power packed, it's power packed with benefits. Um, because of its lightweight, it's easier to handle and store. I mean, for me in the chair, I find perlite brilliant because it's really light. I can move it around the garden with great ease. I can add it into my compost. It opens it all up and it's absolutely superb. And it doesn't sort of get messy on your hands either. But the other great thing about perlite is that when perlite is heated rapidly in industrial furnaces, the volcanic glass softens, causing intracted water molecules to turn to steam and expand the perlite particles. A bit like popcorn, I suppose, that suddenly comes to my head. So increasing its volume by about sort of 20 times its original size. And this extra space, therefore, absorbs water, helping to keep roots moist and preventing them from becoming overwatered. So from that point of view, you know, perlite is absolutely brilliant. It also prevents the need for sort of other 
additives and chemicals. Uh, it's free of organic contaminants, making it naturally pest and disease proof, really, preventing the need of chemicals, uh, required to prevent any sort of pests or diseases at a later stage. It also has an ideal pH range of six and a half to seven and a half. So, you know, you can use it on a lot of products um, and a lot of different types of plants. And that's what's great about perlite. It's also really good for improving aeration by adding the, the lightweight media to soil. As I say, it breaks up those compacted areas um, for better water drainage. And plus it has a high displacement value and volume capacity. So therefore, it's got a lot 